All right, hello, my name's Justin, and welcome to this new series we're doing called Wave Lab Workflows uh, with myself. Um, it's gonna be a monthly series, and um, I'm gonna try to break it down. You know, a few, earlier this year I did a um, kind of a rather long video. It was about over three hours, just kind of a basic walkthrough of Wave Lab, and we kind of barely scratched the surface, so I decided to break it down into smaller, uh, just kind of smaller topics so that we can really dive in. So this very first one is going to be helpful for new users of WaveLab and maybe some existing users. And um, it's just going to discuss the differences between the audio editor and the audio montage because they are um, very different environments. Um, so this is going to be different than, you know, your multi-track DAWs where you have basically one workspace. WaveLab has actually a few workspaces. It has the audio editor, audio montage, which is what I use about 99% of the time. And then it has a batch processor and a podcast mode and some other things. But today we're really just going to focus on the audio editor and audio montage. So as I mentioned, if you want to um, search for that one I did back in April. It's about three hours long, but it really covers some of the settings, and it's just a quick, well, it's actually not that quick, but it's an overview of, of the program itself, and now we're going to break it down into smaller topics. And also in that episode, I um, shared some settings with you because um, you know, there's a lot of settings that you can use with WaveLab, and there's some things that I prefer differently than the default, and everyone has their own way of working, so you know, if you want to use kind of my starting point, you can download some of those settings and presets. Now, they're not mastering presets that are automatically going to make your songs sound good. And that's not really the essence of these series. You know, it's more about how to use WaveLab and, and do what you want to do. But you can download, you know, things like metadata presets so that when you render master files, all of your um, files have the right metadata embedded in them. And different settings for rendering, you know, file naming scheme, all that good stuff. So check out that previous one. And in the uh, video description of this one and the previous one, you can download my settings from, from Dropbox. So, um, and it explains how to do it in that video. So enough about the previous video. And the last thing I want to say is next month, um, we're going to have a special guest, uh, Pete Lyman from Infrasonic Mastering in Nashville. I'm going to do more of an interview type thing with him. Um, we're going to do a little bit. Um, the first half is going to be a little bit more like kind of a working class audio feel where we talk about, you know, how he got into mastering and how it's changed over the years and, and what he's doing now and things like that. And then it's going to transition into a little bit of wave lab and, and technical talk. And hopefully we can arrange it so he can share his screen with us and, and show us how he has his wave lab set up because it's it's so customizable that you know everyone's going to have a slightly different layout um, whatever their preference is so pete's going to be on december 17th we're going to do these at the same time 11 a.m eastern and um, after the new year going to try to stick to a more consistent schedule probably every thursday or sorry every third thursday of the month uh, at the same time but with the holidays and getting going it's a little goofy but december 17th watch for P pete lyman and it should be a good um, episode so let's get down to wave lab itself i'm going to share my screen with you i don't need to be on camera that much so i'm going to open up wave lab and um kind of i'm going to show you the audio editor first because um, I don't use the audio editor that much, so I just kind of want to show you what I use it for and what it can do if you want to use it. I'm going to spend a little more time in the montage because, in my opinion, it does more, and, and that's where I prefer to work. So we'll just kind of go through the audio editor first, and there's a few ways to get there. Um, you, can, you can open a new audio file, and it's empty, but typically this is not what I'm doing. Typically I'm opening existing files, so... A good example um, today is somebody sent me some songs, or a song, to master. And I'm going to open it up, and I can basically um, right-click and open them up in WaveLab. And you can see up here it says Audio Editor. Um, the Audio Editor is basically a destructive editing environment. It... Uh, 
it's probably good for people that are maybe doing sound design or um, broadcast, but I, I don't like to use the audio editor for actual work just because of its non-destructive or sorry, because of its destructive nature. You know, I, I work with a lot of clients who are sometimes indecisive. So they may say, you know, can you try this? And then say, can you try that? And then can you split the difference? So that, that gets a little challenging to do in the um, audio editor just because it's so destructive. It's probably a good place to work. Like I said, if you're doing sound design and you're making the decisions and you just want to go quickly because you can just highlight a section and delete it or silence it. So it's great for that. And there are some undo options that I'll get into. But basically, I typically use the audio editor just for checking out incoming files or checking out files that I've made before I send them out. So it's a good place for doing a little quality control. So um, before I get into the audio editor, let's just briefly touch on some of the things I talked about in the last video, just because my layout probably looks a little different than, than yours. Um, this is kind of the default layout of WaveLab. And over here, I want to talk about the master section. Um, this is, when you're using the audio editor, this is really the only place that you can um, insert plugins, you know, like EQ, compressor, limiter. Um, this is where you insert your plugins. And because I'm not really using it in this way, I, I have my own kind of layout. I, I'd rather have a little more screen space than um, see that. And I can just show and hide the uh, master section when I need to see it. But um, I'll start with kind of how your um, layout could look if you're just new to WaveLab. As you can see, you have some nice metering um, history. But what I really want to show you is the transport, uh, because someone had a question about this a few days ago in the Facebook group uh, that we have, uh, the WaveLab Facebook group that we have, and um, it was about the transport. And when you first install WaveLab, it works in a way that when you press play and then you press stop, it works kind of like a, a tape machine where it just picks up from where it left off. So here's an example of that. You know, I could listen to the start of the song and then stop, and then it just keeps going. So that makes it hard to kind of check your edits and check for errors. So I think, you know, most people that I know of prefer the other way. So what you need to do is right click on the stop button. You don't, not on the play button, on the stop button, and you just change it to after standard playback. So if you're, if that's been kind of driving you nuts, then that's where you need to find that setting. Now, every time you press the space bar, it will start from the same spot, whether it's the beginning or over here. Um, and again, you use this little um, icon here, and you can do a number of things. You can, so I keep the transport hidden because I really don't need to press the buttons. I just use, I'm typically starting and stopping and going to the beginning or the end of a file, and I have shortcuts for those. But So you can hide the transport to get a little more space. Um, I like the command bar at the top left. And um, I also keep the file group tabs hidden just for a little more real estate. We'll talk about file, file groups in a little bit. But basically, file groups are a way to keep your files organized if you have a ton of files open. You know, you could have project A and then project B. I'm, I'm typically not having that many files open where I need this. But I guess if, if you're doing sound design or some kind of intense editing where you have a ton of files open, you can separate them into file groups and you get nice tabs. But again, that's not something I use and um, it's sort of a new feature. So I just keep the file group tabs hidden. And again, that gives you a little bit more real estate on your screen. And for now, I'm gonna say goodbye to the um, master section and just to get a little more space. But back to where I was going with this, these are some files that somebody sent me to master and I can see there's plenty of headroom. They did send me their um, reference uh, mix that's pretty loud and smash. So that's kind of what I'm aiming for. That's probably what the artist signed off on. And that's once I do my thing, we probably need to get back to this ballpark, but, and also the instrumental. Um, but again, I'm using this. You can um, analyze the file. If for whatever reason you need to analyze a file, and I'll talk more about that when I talk about outgoing files, but we'll just do kind of a rundown here of. Um, what you're gonna what what you can do in the audio editor. So there's open. Um, it's basically all the things you're used to in a file menu. It's just laid out a little bit differently on the side, but you can create a new file, open a file, import a file, save and save as, and things like that. Um, 
the view tab is also not something I use a lot because again, I have all these kind of memorized their shortcuts, but the view ribbon tab up, up here is the ribbon tab and then you have the individual tabs. So the view ribbon tab will um, let you do some zooming. You know, if, if you want to do it that way, you can, but again, yeah, there's shortcuts um, involved with this um, that I have some customized that you can download from the video notes or you can program your own if you go to file preferences shortcuts as you can see you can search for any command in this box um, and then you can see what the existing shortcut is or you can make your own it's pretty customizable in that way so um, that's also why i just don't spend much time in the view area because all this stuff that you can do for me is all shortcuts and things like that but if you want to change the uh you know, the zoom. And usually if you hover over a, a button, it will tell you um, what it's going to do. Um, you can do some cursor type things, tell it to go to a certain spot, um, things like that. Um, playback, you can just decide if it's going to follow the cursor or follow your view. I, I, I work quickly, so I like to control the scrolling. I don't like it when it scrolls for me because it's usually a little slow for me, but I like to work fast. So the edit um, ribbon tab is, is pretty powerful. It has a lot of um, options here. And this is where you have your tools. Wavelab doesn't have a whole lot of tools, you know, like you would be used to, like scissors, um, all those types of editing tools you see in other DAWs, because uh, it's a little smarter than that. It's, if In the montage, I'll show you that if you, you know, if you right-click the lower portion of a waveform, you're going to get more you're going to get different choices and that's true in the audio editor if you get if you right click in the lower portion you see some options if you right click in the upper portion you see different options so there's not a whole lot of tools but we do have time selection of course to just highlight an area you know if you're wanted to do some destructive editing you could highlight this and press delete to mute it or the other delete button in the above the arrows to actually remove the space um, there is a pencil tool for um, redrawing waveforms, but I'm sure by now most people are more comfortable with spectral editing. So, pencil tool is not, so, or the pen tool is not something I use much. And then um, the play tool just allows you to drop the cursor and play a little bit. So, I, I, I would say 99.999% of the time I use this um, time selection tool, um, which is why I'm not as familiar with these even. Um, so you can do some other time selection things here. Um, if you want to select a specific range, and if you'd rather just punch it in or type it in to be really precise, you can do that. Um, of course, you have copy, cut, paste, the usual stuff there. Um, crop. If for some reason you just want that section, you can highlight it and press crop. Um, this is something that um, is only available in the editor but you can swap the stereo channels if for some reason you need to swap the left and right. It's very quick, but you gotta remember that this is destructive editing. So um, you can get a little trouble here if you're not careful. So if you're gonna use this mode, I highly suggest um, the first thing you do before you start working is file and save as, and you wanna save it as, you know, version one or your edit or something, just so you can always get back to the, the main thing. And because um, we'll get into that later, but you you, you want to make sure you have a, a backup of this file somewhere so that if worse comes to worse, you can get back to square one, um, although there are some nice improvements that'll go over. So basically, the Edit tab does a lot of this um, type of stuff, and there's an external editor, which I'm going to talk about in the montage section, but um, this allows you to send a section of audio to an external editor, such as... Um, Spectra Layers by Steinberg, which is great. Um, I, I need to spend more time with Spectra Layers, um, but it also works with third-party um, editors such as um, Isotope RX or SoundForge, anything like that, where you can just highlight this and press the external editor tool, and that will open it in your external editor of choice, which you set up in Preferences, um, Global External Applications. You can see I have um, RX and spectral layers designated. And if you had another one, you could designate it here. And these are all assignable with shortcuts too. So that's pretty great. Um, 
So that's basically the Edit tab, pretty powerful. Um, but again, I don't look in here too often because it, it's all shortcut-based um, stuff. And um, Insert, so this is where, if you wanted to add some markers, you could add a marker, whether it's a loop, you know, a region that you want to loop. Markers, again, are something I use more in the montage to um, determine, you know, where the, where the track starts, if it's an EP or an album and things like that. So, um, but you can assign shortcuts to all these. As you can see, um, Control F13 would be this shortcut. Um, so, and a lot of this is self-explanatory if you just hover over it. Um, Process is also a really powerful tool, and this is where I want to talk about bit depth because um, this is not a great example because it's a floating point file, but anytime you're applying digital processing um, to a file, it's going to increase the bit depth. If it's a 24-bit file to start with, if you apply a game change or a fade out, um, it's going to increase the bit depth to um, floating point. So it's my suggestion that if you're going to be doing that type of processing, now if you're just doing straight removal of audio or trimming up silence, then you don't have to worry about the bit depth. But if you're doing any sort of digital change to the audio, it's going to increase the bit depth. So that's where I was. Uh, this is already a 32-bit floating point file, as you can see down here, 32-bit float, and it's a 48K sample rate file. And at the bottom, you get some other nice information like the total length, um, where the cursor is and things like that. Um, but let's talk more about the processing. You know, if you want to do a simple gain change, you can click on this and type in, you know, um, plus six, and it just turns it up. And again, it's destructive, so I would be doing this on a copy. Uh, but it's a really basic gain change for files. Um, envelope. Um, if you wanted to do something crazy, you could draw some volume points and press apply and now that applied that envelope uh, i'm not sure why you'd want to do that but that's just a place to sort of automate the level um, i don't use this a whole lot but there's been times where it comes in handy um, remove dc offset um, that's pretty self-explanatory as far as removing any dc offset if it exists but wave lab is telling me there isn't any to worry about um, so there's nothing to worry about there but this is just basic gain and level type features here. Um, normalizing, um, you know, a lot of people think about normalizing after mastering because of the streaming services and all that, but I actually use normalization a lot before I even start, and that's so I can get all the songs of an EP or an album to be kind of on the same page, because um, that just makes your life easier. Sometimes you get an album or an EP and some mixes are kind of loud and some aren't, and it's all over the map. And normalization before you start mastering is a great way to just very quickly um, take that off your plate so you can worry more about some creative and, you know, stuff like that. So I'm going to show you in the montage where I normally um, would normalize, but um, the first normalizing option is level. And if this is just for normalizing the peak level. I, I've never used this because I don't find it very useful, but if you need to... Make sure your file's highest peak is minus 1 or minus 3 or minus 10. You can type that in here and press apply, and it will change. The more useful to me um, normalization option is loudness. So let's say you've – this would be more for post-production. Let's say you've done a post-production mix of something, and they've asked that it be delivered at minus 23 you know, for broadcast specs, and there's all sorts of presets in here. YouTube 2019. Um, so if you wanted to use that preset, you could. Broadcast. So we'll go with minus 23. Um, and there's some other more advanced options, like loudness of the entire file, top of loudness range, which is a really unique feature for WaveLab. I've never seen this in another program. But to me, it's a little more natural to the ear um, to use top of loudness range or maximum short term. But usually for broadcast and even streaming, you know, they're doing the integrated loudness of the entire file. So if you were finalizing a file, you would use loudness of entire file. True peaks or digital peaks, um, I'm not going to get into the differences, but um, we'll save that for another episode. But you can decide if you're going to use digital peaks or true peaks for the ceiling because you're also um, determining a ceiling. It's, it's this average loudness and or this peak level here. So I'm going to just apply it 
and so it, it changed it a little bit. This mix wasn't too far off from minus 23, but um, the loudness normalization tool is pretty handy um, either before or after you start. And then another thing I've really only seen in WaveLab that's kind of cool is pan normalization. So let's say you get a mix and you know it's a little lopsided, or maybe you did a tape transfer and the left and right channels are a little out of, a little out of balance. Um, you can normalize the panning so that it's um, more even left and right. Now, it's up to you to decide if that's better or worse, but this will at least do kind of in a mathematical, scientific way, it will balance the left and right channels for you, and then you can decide uh, if you like it or if you want to fine-tune it from there. So really cool stuff in there for normalizing the peak level, the average loudness, or the panning. Um, and we also have fade ins and outs. Now, I don't like to do my fade ins and outs in the editor because, again, it's destructive. And maybe it's just my client base, but sometimes they say, oh, let's do a little fade out on that. Oh, can you do a little more? Can you split the difference? And again, it just gets challenging in the editor because it's destructive. So in the montage, that's all non destructive and it's super easy to just make changes and know what you did last time and, and all that good stuff. But if you needed to do a fade out destructively, you could just press fade out. Or if you wanted to fade this file in, you can just press fade in. So this is, again, really quick. I have a feeling that if I was you know, self-producing a podcast or sound design, maybe the audio editor would be a little faster and more direct because you're the one making the decisions. So you know, do, do what works best for you but I'm just showing you the differences here in this episode. Um, next, we have time stretching, pitch shifting, and resampling. I think WaveLab has one of the best um, algorithms for um, you know, tempo changes. You know, Sometimes people ask me to, if I can speed up a song by a couple beats per minute or slow it down. And I've used a handful of options over the years and um, I recently had a project where somebody was really getting in the mastering stage, which is probably not the best place for it, but playing with the tempos a little bit, up up, up one beat per minute, down one beat per minute, and um, WaveLab ended up being the best sounding of the bunch that I tried um, with, with the least amount of artifacts. So WaveLab has really good algorithms for pitch shifting and time stretching. You know, I was able to adjust the tempo of the song without adjusting the pitch, but you can do both like a tape machine would where it's changes the speed and the pitch. Um, some other things I rarely use in my line of work, but pitch bend, pitch quantizing, and re reverse. Um, reverse came in handy for me. I was um, mastering, I was remastering an album where we couldn't revisit the mixes and they needed a radio edit. So I was in the montage, which I'll show you. I opened up a copy of the mix in the audio editor. I just highlighted the, um, the bad words and pressed reverse, and um, then we had something that would work for radio. And then I just inserted that in the montage, and every you know, then we had what we needed. So reverse is really handy. Reverse doesn't exist in the montage, so if you're going to do any reversing, you have to do it in the audio editor. But it's really easy to send files from the montage to the to this audio editor. So um, reverse can be handy for those types of radio edits. Um, there is a um, just a basic beep thing too for for doing radio edits, which we'll get to. But um, lastly, you know, we we can turn on auto split, um, which is probably handy if you're maybe re capturing a live concert in one file and you need to do some splits or edits. But last in the process tab is invert phase, um, effect morphing, which um, I've used a couple times. It's a really unique way of blending between two effects, but I would argue that probably it's a little easier to do in the montage. So um, that's really all I'm going to talk about in the process tab for today because um, I want to get to the montage. Um, correction tab is just for some error corrections, clicks and pops. Um, but to be honest, I find the um, spectral editor to be even um, better for that. And you can really customize. I actually just set up a new computer recently, and I forgot to change it to orange. I prefer the orange view. So you can really customize the um, the tone and look of the um, spectrogram view to how you like it. But as if for those that aren't familiar with spectral editing, it's basically like I, I, 
I say spectral editing is like Photoshop for audio. Um, I, I don't know what, exactly what this is, but if this were some kind of mouth click or digital click or unwanted sound, I could just highlight it and press the in painting button and it removes it and now it's uh, basically gone. So whatever that noise was, I'll undo that. Some kind of noise there, highlight it. So spectral editing, it's really cool. It's I get a little bit carried away sometimes cleaning up mouth clicks and thumps and plosives and uh, clicks from bad edits, but a lot of that shows up in mastering and Yes, you could argue that maybe the mix engineer should clean that up, but usually when you're in the mastering mode, you know, it's just easier to clean it up in mastering and it's easier for you to hear it and all that good stuff. So spectral editing is really powerful um, and WaveLove has a really good spectral editor. And then, of course, you, you can send it to an, a third party program of your choice. And as long as I'm on these views down here in the bottom left, um, of course, you have your waveform view, spectrogram view. Wavelet view, which is kind of like WaveLab's, um, a custom thing that WaveLab does. It's like a spectral editor or like a spectrogram view, but a little more detail in the lower frequencies. And then this is kind of cool. Um, I should use it more often. The loudness view this shows me the loudness of the file in a few different ways. So really good for the audio editor, in my opinion, is great for audio analysis. Um, and Speaking of audio analysis, that's the next tab. Um, I'm going to use their reference mix because that's probably more exciting, but um, you can press the global analysis button and brings up this global analysis box. And you can press analyze. You can do, you can do this all with shortcuts, but I want you guys to see it um, more slowly. And this is going to tell me some information about the file, um, the peak levels. Um, it's going to tell me that the loudness, I can go with raw loudness, which is basically your RMS levels. It's a pretty loud file, but that's the world we live in. And then this has your LUFS readings, um, integrated minus 9.2. That's not too crazy. Um, must have some loud moments. Um, the short-term loudness, the maximum, um, maximum momentary loudness, things like that. So this is, again, really good for checking out incoming and outgoing files. I don't find myself dealing with the, the pitch and any of this extra stuff, but it's there if you need it. And you can open up more than one box. So if you're comparing files, you know, you can press the plus button and now you can analyze this, which I do sometimes if I'm comparing, um, you know, maybe my mastered version to their rough master, I can see that they're a little bit louder, a little bit quieter, things like that. So you can open up as many of these as you want, I believe. Um, so but let's keep going in the anal analyze window. Um, another really cool thing here is um, the audio file comparator. So if you have two files and you're not sure what's different, you can um, use this tool. So I'm going to choose the instrumental version and then the other one that's similar and press OK. And I had it make a delta file. Let me let me slow down and do that again. Um, you can have it make a, a delta file, which is basically going to give you the difference between the two files. So, again, really good if you got two files and you're just not sure what the difference is. This is going to um, make it very clear what the differences are. So that's a cool tool. Um, the 3D analysis is interesting to look at. Um, so you can look at it in a whole different way. Um, this is just telling you what it's analyzing. Um, you can you can you can analyze the audio input or the file rendering, which we'll get to. Um, so that's the analyze tab, and then finally, let's talk about the render tab. Um, this is where, if you were going to insert some plugins here, let's say I insert an uh, EQ and a limiter. Of course, it's thinking, oh, I don't want the Waves L2. How is that even in my recent list? I, I never use the Waves L2, so um, I don't know what that's all about. But let's go back to the Fab Filter Pro L2. Anyways, let's say you have some plugins in your master section here and you like how they sound. Basically, how you get them out of WaveLab is rendering. Some people say export. Um, I like to be more correct with my terminology in WaveLab, so I 
when I'm helping people that we're talking about the same thing. So when you're done, if you have your sounds dialed in how you like them with your EQ limiter, whatever you want to insert, you can insert um, more than two plugins. It just adds more slots. Um, so when you have what you like, you basically have to render a new file and you can have some presets. I don't have many presets in the audio editor because I don't render many files from here, but you have some options for including or bypassing the master section. Obviously you'd want to include it. Uh, presets. I'll show you my render presets in the montage because I have quite a lot of them. In fact, let me just open. I have all these render presets for if I'm rendering a full album or the individual tracks or vinyl sides, all this good stuff. Um, but because of my workflow, I just don't render files from the audio editor too often. But this is where you would say, I'm happy with this. I'm going to render a 24-bit wave. I want it to go here. I'll just use my desktop, for example. Um, you would decide what you want to call it. Um, you can call it fi file name. Um, there's a nice list of recently used stuff, which is handy when you've got a nice workflow. Um, a naming scheme, you know, you could add 2448 to the end of the file so you know that it's 24-bit 48K. So the, this is one of my favorite things of WaveLab, really, is the render tab and the naming scheme and the presets, which I use more in the montage. So um, that's really most of what I want to show you in the editor because I want to get to the montage because it's got a lot of a lot of good stuff. I just want to make sure I'm not forgetting anything. Um, I do want to say that um, the master section here, I call it the global master section because it's important to realize that whatever file you're playing, the audio is going to go through it. So as you can see, when I switch from one file to the next, um, it's playing the same settings. So you need to specifically save and load these settings for that file. And there's a setting I want to show you that you may not know about, even if you've been using WaveLab. But if you go to a file, it's called the companion file. And most people have it set to the default, like I do, because, again, I don't use the editor too often for um, processing. But right now, the companion file is being saved in an independent folder, which is fine for the short term because it's going to um, open and close my or it's going to open and save my master section settings. But where it's really dangerous is if you reformat your computer, if you get a new computer, all these files are living in a um, very hidden and off the beaten path uh, folder. So that's that's a problem for long term archiving. So You'd want to uncheck that box um, so that it's not being um, saved in an independent folder. And now when I go to, um, hopefully I don't need to restart WaveLab for that to happen, but now when I go to this, let's say I love the master section settings for this song, I'm going to go to save master section preset, and I can rename it if I want, but by default it takes the name of the, uh, f the audio file, which to me makes sense. And there's some options in here for um, what you want to save. But now I'm going to save it, and if we go to, these are still in my downloads folder, so I'm just checking these out. There's a .vs file, and that is um, just the master section settings. So there's no audio here. I could delete this, and the audio would still be there, but what I would lose is the master section settings. So you have to be a little bit more disciplined when you're using the audio editor of making sure that you've using this little tiny um, star on the bottom. And again, you can do this with shortcuts, but you need to make sure that you're saving and loading the master section um, kind of in, in a disciplined way so that you're not making a mistake and processing a file with a different song's master section settings or saving or loading the wrong one. So again, you gotta, it's, it, it, to me, it leaves room for user error and I like to work quickly. So I don't, it's more like I don't trust myself um, to do that. Um, I want to do a whole episode about the master section because I could probably fill that up. But basically, I call it the global master section because whether it's a montage, which we're going to do next, or audio file, um, it's always processing. Now, you can press this star with the other icon and bypass it. So now it's bypassed when that file plays. And that's file specific, as you can see. When I go to these files, it's still active. But when I go to this file down here, it's flashing, telling me that the master section is not active. So there are some uh, safety nets, but to me, it can get a little bit, 
you can get yourself into trouble if you're not careful here. So um, just be really careful about saving and loading your master section presets, um, which you're going to want to, if you need to recall a song, you know, if someone says it's great, but need a little adjustment, you're going to want to recall that precisely how it was. So, um, and just a really quick rundown of the master section, you have your effect slots, you have resampling for if you're playing a 96k file and you need it to be reduced to 44.1, you can do that here. There are some nice meters um, in the master section. And faders, you, I have my faders locked at zero so that, you know, what I'm doing is at zero and it makes sense with outside world. Um, so, and again, a lot of these settings are available to download from the video description. Um, final effects and dithering, that's where you could put you can put anything here, but that's where you'd maybe want to put a, a true peak limiter or a, a, and then fo follow it up by a dithering plugin. This is really the end of the processing chain because um, when you do resampling, the peak levels can change a little bit. So um, you may want a true peak limiter and then, of course, dithering, and that's the end of the processing chain. What we have here is playback processing. There's three slots so that you could... Um, I have Clarity M, which is a hardware little meter on my desk I'm sure many are familiar with I do mastering you could put room correction software such as sonar works or headphone correction software wave lab comes with an encoder checker so that you can kind of hear what your material might sound like when it's reduced to mp3 or AAC or Og Vorbis which is what Spotify uses so um, that's what the playback processing is all about and the nice thing here is the plugins in these three slots do not get rendered, so there's no danger. I'm sure those of you that use Sonarworks and other programs have accidentally rendered um, a master file, or you've rendered a file with Sonarworks accidentally turned on and your mix sounds really weird. Um, the playback processing takes that out of the equation, meaning you hear these plugins, but they don't get processed, which is a nice safety net. And they're also not showing up on your meters because you wouldn't want your level or frequency meters or analyzers to be showing you what Sonarworks is doing for listening. Um, so anyways, that's the playback processing um, slots. And I'm going to reset the master section and get it back to how I like it. And if you're using my shortcuts, I'm just using um, Control M to check it out once in a while. You know, sometimes I need to reload Clarity M. But the nice thing is that you can tell wave lab to keep these the same every time you close and open so you, for me this is set it and forget it but if you're doing if you're using this for a lot of processing you can um, have it start clean every time so you're not accidentally starting from a different starting point so um, and the very last thing I want to talk about in the editor because it's pretty cool let's say you've made some edits you can see that it's putting some little markers here and this is new to wave lab 10 but it allows you to undo um, certain things. So let's say, I'm gonna undo that and go in order. Let's say I wanna make an edit here, and edit here, edit here, and of course, I would be doing more useful edits, but um, let's say I wanna get, the, I don't like this edit in the first part. Instead of having to undo all these edits and lose a lot of work, I can double click in here, and it shows me the edit, And I can replace edit with um, doing it a little bit backwards because I don't do this too often. But you can replace selected audio from this version. So you can get back to um, the initial version if you want to. So this is kind of nice. It's, it's kind of like a, a nonlinear undo where you can just get certain pieces back if you need it, which is something that other editors has bothered me because sometimes you have done a ton of editing and then you just want to rework one little piece and it's like it's a challenge so wave lab has kind of solved that problem with uh, with this new um, edit history and the ability to undo so enough about all that i want to get to um, the audio montage because that's my favorite place to work um, so i have a lot of templates made so if i'm going to start a new um, assembly montage, I can press control nine and I have a 96 K montage with my metadata, meta, metadata preset loaded. Um, and a lot of settings that I like, it just saves me a lot of time, um, getting with tedious, repetitive stuff, but I want to open, um, I have a couple 
existing montages um, that I've made. And here's an album I recently mastered. Um, and it looks like we went up to version three for some reason, but that happens sometimes. Usually it's just, this one was just some fades and things like that, but let me open up this montage. Now these are things that I've captured from my analog chain. So that's why they're already pretty loud. They don't need a lot of work because I've done a lot of work in the analog realm. But this is like what a typical album looks like for me. I have track one and track two because um, I like to stagger the songs. I can't recall if this album had any overlaps. Um, but if you're going to overlap some songs, yeah, no, no real overlaps. But if you're going to overlap some songs, you can do that really easily. You can also overlap songs on the same track, but it gets a little messy. So I like to use two tracks. So if if it calls for this song um, kind of bleeding into the next one, it's very easy to do, and you can adjust the track marker. And then this bottom track is the reference uh, track. Now, in this case, the artist sent me some fades. A lot of times people send me the entire album as one file to reference their fades and crossfades. Um, this, this one sent me just the end of each song, so it's a little harder to to uh, line up, but basically this reference track um, is new to WaveLab 10 and it lets you um, put anything you want on here. The reference track could be, again, their loud, limited um, version that you're shooting for, that they're used to, um, and you can solo it um, right here. And the nice thing about the reference track is that it's not part of the, when you go to render your files, it's not... Um, there's no chance of this getting played back or rendered. So reference tracks are very separate from normal tracks. And you can route these to another hardware output, which I do. So on my monitor controller, I can just press a button and I'm hearing what I'm doing or what their version was. It's very quick to just press a button. But if you're using a simple interface and don't have that, you can just press the ear icon and now, you've, now you're listening to just the reference version. Um, but excuse, a lot of times I just... Um, use the reference version for, for visuals. You know, I've lined up, it's a little bit different, but if I'm trying to recreate a sequence, then um, I really oftentimes use this just as a visual for recreating what they are envisioning for the sequence and we can change it from there. So that's a typical um, album. I'm gonna delete the reference track now because um, so we don't have to look at it, but the montage, again, to me, when I hear people say that they, um, use WaveLab, but they never use the montage. To me, that's a little crazy because whether I'm doing a single song, an EP or an album, I'm always in the montage because it's just so powerful. Um, so aside from arranging the songs how you'd like, you know, you can decide how much space is in between them. And I'll do a fresh setup um, of loading in some files. But aside from figuring that out, um, and this marker isn't linked, um, you can... Um, you can insert effects in so many places. So I'm going to go to the Effects tab, which is called the Inspector. Um, it used to be called the Effects tab. WaveLab 10 changed it to Inspector. And again, if you're using the default um, layout, it may look like this to you. you got the Master section, which is, again, the global master section. It's last in the processing chain when you're in the montage. You know, It comes after all your montage effects. Um, but again, you got to remember that it's not automatically tied to your uh, project. You have to manually load and save it. And for me, when I first started using WaveLab, I had a hard time with that because I was used to a program where whatever you did was saved with the project, and that's that. Um, and as you notice when I open this project, I have all the necessary WAV files, but I also have these .mon files, and that's the the montage file that keeps track of everything where the files go, what their settings are, all your effects. So it's really the if you use kind of the way I, if you use Wave WaveLab the way I do, it's really the only file you need to worry about um, in terms of your project. You know, it's gonna it's gonna reference your wave files, and that's another unique thing with WaveLab compared to other programs. The montage doesn't make copies of the files for you and load them in. It's a little bit more disciplined in that it's if these files I have loaded in. It's just referencing them. It's just saying, I know where they are, so I'm going to load it in. It's, and I like that because it's not making a copy. You're not in danger of um, changing the bit depth or sample rate unintentionally. 
So it's just a really direct way of working. And, I, and it, it also prevents file redundancies. You know, you have your files, and when you load it in, it doesn't make a copy of it. And now you, now you have two, um, things like that. So just remember that the, the .mon file is your montage file. It's equivalent to like your Cubase file or Pro Tools session. And that's really what I, and you can see I have versions because I like to, the first thing I do is always version one. And then I, if I have to make a change, it's immediately version two because you never know, you know, I made a version three on this. If, if the client said, oh, can we go back to version one for this particular thing? Now I know exactly what I had because I can just open version one. And the .mon files are not very big. As you can see, it's 67 kilobytes. So it's not like it's duplicating your entire project. It's just a little tiny file that knows what's going on. So back to what I was talking about, effects. Um, now these are my captures from analog. So ideally, they don't need many plugins. But I, you can see I did a couple touch-ups. But you can insert plugins right on each clip. And this is, to me, the, the power of WaveLab or any or most mastering programs, really. You know, I see so many people that master in a multi-track program, and they say, I've mastered the project, but now I have to, you know, put the songs in order and make the file. And to me, it's not a master until it's 100% ready for production and distribution. So um, that's where WaveLab's strengths really shine here, is we're going to not only make it everything sound good, but we're going to make it 100% ready for production and distribution and again, I do a lot of mastering for bands and artists, so I'm speaking from a, a context of releasing it to you know, Spotify, Apple Music, CDs, still vinyl. I do a lot of vinyl pre-masters. So that's kind of my background for what I'm speaking. I don't do a lot of post-production or anything like that. But either way, um, the montage is super powerful because I see a lot of people working in a multi-track program, and they have kind of the stair-step thing where they have Every song has its own audio track, and they got this 12 stair steps of tracks, and the waveforms are super tiny. And it's also really inefficient because you're running plugins on every track for the entire album, so it's not hard to bog down your computer, and um, suddenly your computer is really stressed out. Whereas with WaveLab, and again, with, with most mastering programs, you have clip-based effects. Some call it object or item, but WaveLab calls it clips. So I can put plugins right on this one song. And uh, this is where I put any song specific things, like a little EQ. You know, I wouldn't put anything that I want on the entire program or al album, like a peak limiter or dithering, but I would put um, EQ, compression, anything that you want just for this particular song. It's called clip effects, and that's in the inspector which I like to keep up here just because I've been using WaveLab for a while, and that is where it used to be. Um, so that's that's my two cents on that. But um, So you can load, I th believe, I've never really run into it, but I believe 10 effects is the limit. So you can load up to 10 plugins just on each song, which should be more than enough. If you need more than that, you might have problems. Um, um, there's track effects. Now, this is not to be confused with... CD tracks or album tracks, when it says track effect, that means the audio track, the montage track. So I very rarely use track effects because it would I can't think of many cases where I would only want a specific effect on every other song in my case. Um, but there are, I'll try to show you an example of where I did use track effects in a moment. But track effects for me, nearly every project, it's empty. But what, what I do use is the output. So this is the montage output. This is um, every so, so the signal flow is clip effects, track effects, montage output effects, and then of course master section, which I keep empty. So that's kind of the signal flow. But there's more than one way to work. Some people like to do um, special limiting for each song. Again, I've dialed these in in the analog realm. So for for my process, these songs are already all very much on the same page. So I'm getting away with. Um, a limiter that works for the entire record. And as you can see, I'm using clip gain to feed a little more in or a little less. You can automate levels. Again, this is um, before the output for sure. And then in the um, envelope tab, you can decide if this um, volume envelope is before or after the clip effects. Um, I'm typically doing it before the clip effects as well, but you can you can customize that. Um, 
and I want to get through a quick montage setup, but I also want to tell you everything you can do in the montage. But um, the big thing that you're doing in the montage is clip effects and you know output effects to get things sounding how you want. Um, and again, whether I'm doing a single or an album, I use the montage because it's so important to me to dial in the, um, you know, kind of like how much silence do you have before the first downbeat. And because these are captures from analog, my um, these have 200 milliseconds of digital silence baked, baked into them. But if I were loading in an unmastered file, I'd probably want to trim up. This would probably be like hiss or noise or something, room tone. I'd probably want to clean that up so it's a clean downbeat. And you typically don't want your downbeat to be right at zero milliseconds. Now, if you're doing sample work and library work, that's totally different. But for most albums, you want a little buffer so that when you hit play, whether it's the media player or the CD player, you want a little bit of, of space before the uh, downbeat. So I'd clean that up. But you also don't want your marker right there because when you render the files, it's going to have it's going to be too abrupt. So you can make sure your marker is at zero. The first downbeat's at 200 milliseconds. So for me, even if I'm doing a single, I want to be doing this kind of stuff. I want to control when the file's going to start versus when's the downbeat, and then how does it taper off and where the marker is going to dictate where the file ends. Now, this is an album, so it's a little different, but um, you get the idea. So if you've been mastering singles in the editor, I think you might find that the montage is easier, safer. You get a safety net of, of seeing different versions. You get markers. You get It's easier to import a metadata preset and then render like all the different sample rates. So um, we'll get it, we'll get more into that in future um, episodes. But just a quick run through of the ribbon tab in the montage, because as you can see, they're a little different. If I open up an audio file, um, if it's still there, um, you can see that the ribbon tab differs a little bit when you switch between the editor and uh, montage. A lot of similar stuff, but some differences. So let's run through these if there's any differences. The view stuff is very similar. Edit, um, a lot of similarities. Um, a lot of it's self-explanatory as well. Um, one thing that's cool about WaveLab 2 is, by default, it's in ripple mode, which means if somebody says, can you add a little more space be between songs one and two, when you do that, everything after it follows along, so you're not screwing up your other um, sequence uh, sp song spacings. Now, if you're doing this in a, a multi-track DAW, this would probably happen. And yeah, you can add more space between the first two songs, but look what happens there. You got a problem. Um, you can also do just on a track basis ripple mode, but to me, that's goofy. I pretty much always keep it in global ripple mode, so that way when I'm adjusting the song spacing, um, everything after it follows along real nicely. That's something you typically only see in a mastering program, um, with some exceptions, but a lot of multi-track programs don't do that. And that's just why, you know, at the end of the day, using WaveLab saves me so much time versus using, you know, something that is more meant for recording and mixing. You know, there's a reason why WaveLab exists. It's got really specialized tools, which I'm barely scratching the surface of. Um, but that's a, a powerful thing in the edit view um, replace and I don't I, I use a lot of shortcuts so I don't always know which um, menu these are in but replace is a really huge one because how many times have you been mastering a project and a few days later they they say oh we uh, changed the mix but it's only a little change um, so just use your same settings well that that can be easier hard depending on your workflow but what you can do in wave lab really quickly is um, select a clip and press this replace audio file button and you can browse for it but i have it set up as a, a shortcut where i can just press command r and it's asking me okay what's the new file and if you do things correctly your new file should be perfectly in sync with the old one and now you've got the new version of the mix um, and the other thing i use this for is when i do instrumentals you know which the, i did with this album you know once the mastering is approved i can save as and type instrumental, which already exists. So I'm going to give it a unique name. So let's say the record's mastered, approved, but now i got to do instrumentals. You can just kind of go song by song and grab the instrumental version. And now you got the instrumental versions popped in there. So replace 
for me is really a powerful tool for when people send you new mixes or you're doing your instrumental version and stuff like that. Um, process, not a whole lot going on here because um, a lot of your processing is done non-destructively with you know clip effects and whatnot. So there's not a whole lot of stuff in here. But um, one thing that's really cool, and I'm showing it to you slightly out of context, but let's say that this was an unmastered album that I'm about to start on. Um, the meta normalizer is super powerful because as you can see, um, these songs are a little bit all over the place, some by design because this is an acoustic ballad, but um, I can open the meta normalizer and you can save your presets. And I can set this to be a certain level that I like to start with. Again, this is a starting point. I can press apply and it's going to non-destructively change the gain of all these songs to um, whatever I told it to, which I believe was minus 16. Um, and to me, that's kind of a healthy starting point if you're going to be working all in the box, all digitally, uh, to apply some plugins. And you can see in the Clips tab that it's non-destructively changed all these songs by a few decibels pre-gain, which means before the clip effects. So sometimes you may want to do that post-gain because uh, for various reasons, if you got your Dynamics processors dialed in, but you just want it to be a little louder, maybe you do it post clip effects, but that's where you can see what's going on. We'll talk more about these up here. Um, fades, again, non-destructive. Um, this was a record where the client got really picky about this song fade out. That's why we got to version three. And all these fades are non-destructive, so I could kind of play around with it. I could get it back. You know, the song went for a while. You can hear them actually stop playing if you undo all the fades. Um, so these fade, these fades here are non-destructive, but you can use some shortcuts to get a basic fade out. As you can see, I really like these. Um, I'll reset this. You know, if I'm going to just kind of taper out some lingering stuff, I really like the um, exponential fade, which I can do with the shortcut X. That was a custom thing I made. But you can get really, you can work really quickly in WaveLab with shortcuts. I'm trying to restrain myself so you can see it a little clearly, but super fast, customizable stuff uh, with fades and things like that. Um, envelope, talked about this a little bit, but each clip has a volume envelope and a pan envelope. So if you needed to pan this one more left, and I like that you can actually see what's happening. If you're going to manually tweak the uh, left and right balance, or there's the um, volume envelope for turning. I tend to do the major gain changes in this clips tab, and then this is more for like if you want to automate up the last chorus, you could do something like that. Um, but that's where you see your envelopes to do automation um, and a lot of other features here. Um, analyze, there's really not much to analyze because it's all real time, right? So to analyze the f what you're processing, you have to render a file and then bring, in, bring it into the audio editor and uh, analyze it there. And then again, my, my favorite part of WaveLab possibly is the render area. Cause once you got everything, how you want it, um, you got to render it out. You don't, I don't like to use the word export cause um, to me, export is, you know, um, exporting the file directly without the processing. So we're, when we're done working and we're happy with it, we render and the render tab has so many options here, but, um, recently, a few versions ago, um, they added, render presets, which is really helpful because instead of having to set all these one by one, you can just do a global setting for whatever you're trying to render. Um, and I discussed it in my last video, but when I'm doing an album, I like to render the entire thing as one long file. What that does is prevent any errors when you do have song overlaps, because if you try to render track by track, um, there's a chance that this um, transition is going to have a little blip when you actually play the master files because plugins have a hard time with hard stops and starts so if you just do a single continuous pass of the entire album you get a duplicate montage with all your processing locked in and then you can render track by track so um, what I did here is I rendered the full album as one floating point file and then this was the result in 96k um, so that's all this processing locked in. And now all I have to do is add a dithering plugin because the audio is floating point still. 
dithering plugin is the only thing running and then I can render 24-bit uh, waves track by track and I've already done that so you end up with these nice folders of um, files um, track by track and that's how that works so I'm running a little short on time I want to switch to the Q&A but basically the montage is um, my favorite place to work you add all the track markers the CD text it's, you have to watch my previous video but it's so fast and easy to um, add in fact I'll show you real quick um, it's so fast and easy to add your files um, that's some singles I did let's say that I'm just starting this up um, I'll keep it short well let me back up so before you add your files you select the ones you want but now it's asking you what order should they be in which is really helpful so you can just use shortcuts or you can drag them or use these buttons but you can determine the song order right here and then you can determine if you want them all on one track or staggered which I prefer or all on their own track which is sometimes nice for stem mastering but that's what happens there and again you can play with the song spacing and once you're happy with the song spacing you can use the CD wizard um, which again I have shortcuts for so I should probably slow down but you can use the CD wizard um, to add markers for each song and the nice thing is that the markers are automatically named exactly what the files are so if you're good with your file naming um, the markers are pr correctly named um, and you can always modify them if you need to modify the marker names but then the next step is the CD text editor um, and I need to copy I'm a little bit out of my element here um, because this is existing stuff but you could copy the file name and open the CD text editor and paste in the uh, some of the basic details and you can copy over um, with one button this is copying the marker names to CD text and then when you render with the right settings the CD text is pop um, populates the metadata so I mean it's so fast and easy to get correctly named files with the right metadata you don't have to you don't have to enter data you know more than once it's very quick and easy and I'll, I'll be doing some um, episodes where I just focus on that because I could spend a whole episode on that but basically the reason I use WaveLab is it's I don't see how it can get much faster to enter in you know arrange the album do your processing do your markers do your metadata and uh, render out the files that you need I mean any sample rate any bit depth um, vinyl premasters here's the one place where I did use track effects I was doing a live album and um, for the digital version there's a lot of talking there's a live stream you know because everyone's live streaming now uh, myself included apparently um, but here is the digital version and they had me trim up a lot of the between song talking um, because they weren't sure how much they wanted to keep so part of the mastering process was to trim up some of the banter but I didn't want to lock myself into any edits because they might say put that back take this out so I used the first track for um, I used the first track for any of the banter because I knew we were going to be doing a vinyl master where we can't have any talking because it's already too long for vinyl so um, I purposely put the the talking on this on its own track because again I wasn't sure about the edits and I knew I, I knew that I was going to need to remove the, them entirely for the vinyl version just for the sake of time um, so as you can see I did some some edits to their talking to remove some stuttering and um, just stuff that wasn't needed um, but in, instead of putting effects right on each clip that would get a little tedious to apply the same processing so I was able to use a track effects um, and again it's a little inefficient because the track effects are running you know this entire time but it, for this particular workflow is the best thing so I, I on this um, track I just used a little EQ a little gain and my old favorite from my mixing days waves Arvox. something special about this plugin um, 
don't use many waves anymore, but that's a really cool plugin. So that's just on this track one for the uh, the banter, and that made the talking sound like it needed to talk. And then when it came time to do the vinyl, I could just um, delete track one and say goodbye to the uh, talking, and then I could arrange it for vinyl and shorten it up and all that good stuff. So sometimes track effects are useful, but very rarely do they get used. Um, but back to you know the montage, just such a great area. And I didn't even get to showing you all the great metering that it has built in, you know, LUFS metering. It has RMS and peak levels. This is unmastered, so that's why it's coming in a little lower. This should be the mastered version. Time code. Oh, another good thing about a mastering program is time code. Let me go back to the working montage. You know, how many times have you been mastering an album and someone says, you know, at 138 on song three, I hear something. Well, if you're in a normal DAW for mixing and uh, recording, you really just have one time code. It's for the entire project. So it gets really hard to find, you know, 45 seconds on song three. But the time code in WaveLab is really customizable. You can make it be the whole project, but you can right click and have it be from the CD track start. You can have it be from the clip start, which is probably going to be very similar to the CD track start, but not always. Um, and a lot of other options. So I usually have it set to CD track start so that I can find um, a certain time in a certain song very easily. So that's just another thing that separates a mastering focus program from something that isn't. There's all these little things that at the end of the week, end of the month, end of the year, going to save you a lot of time. So if you're mastering, you know, more than a few projects a month, you know, I'm mastering every day, all day. So all these things, you know, if I had to use something else, I would be completely, it'd be a total devastation because I'd just be working so slowly. I'd, my, my productivity would just drop off the map and um, maybe I'd even retire. I don't know. But WaveLab is great for, for all this stuff. You know, there's a nice, you know, frequency-based metering, um, wave scope, all this cool stuff. And there's a bunch of tool windows. Um, the bit depth meter is handy again for incoming files. This is interesting because you know somebody sent me these files, and this happens sometimes. Go back to the audio editor. Um, it's a 32-bit float file, but if you if you use the bit depth meter in WaveLab, I can see that it's 24-bit audio. Now that, this isn't a big deal because the peaks aren't high, but um, I don't need to get any peaks over zero back. But it's interesting to know that even though it's a 32-bit floating point file, the audio itself is only 24-bit. And I've had this happen where people send 24-bit or 32-bit float files, but the audio itself is 16-bit because maybe they had a limiter, just a safety limiter on, and the dither was accidentally set to 16-bit. So they've made a 24- or 32-bit file, but the audio itself is 16-bit, and that's where you might have to reach out and say, hey, you know, is it possible to get... A, a, f a corrected audio file that has the full um, bit depth and word length because you know it, they're you, you know it, it, it depends on the material if it's going to be um, a deal breaker but the bit depth meter is a really useful tool for um, working with audio whether it's incoming or to check your outgoing files too I mean so um, I don't know too many programs that have a bit depth meter so that's why um, another great tool with WaveLab um, I'm going to Man, there's so much more I could talk about, but we'll save it for another episode. Again, next week's going to be, um, or next month, December 17th, is going to be Pete Lyman um, from Infrasonic Mastering in Nashville. He's a longtime mastering engineer, done a lot of huge records, uh, cuts lacquers for vinyl, and all around just super nice guy. He's agreed to do one of these, so watch for that December 17th. I am going to do kind of a question and answer um, portion right now and I need to adjust my screen to see if anyone's even watching and then also to uh, read the questions so um, let me grab that on my other laptop where it's a little closer so I can read it and I also wanted to just thank everybody for watching these in you know, I've been helping people with WaveLab in various capacities over the years now, but it seems like this is a good avenue. And, um, you know, I'd love to do a scripted tutorial series that's all edited and in bite-sized pieces, but uh, that takes a lot of time. And 
Um, for, so for right now, these live ones are going to work well for me because then I won't obsess about editing them or anything like that. They just kind of are what they are. So I'm going to take a few questions now. I'm going to try to scroll back a little bit. Somebody's late. Um, I don't know anything about Nuendo updates, but um, there is a Nuendo forum for that. Um, Someone is talking about a different program. Um, so here's a question from um, somebody that says, in the audio montage, adding many songs, I can add many plugins at the same time. Oh, yeah. Um, one thing, I do this a lot. Um, I tend to be kind of a creature of habit. So I have a couple, you can save effects chain presets. And you can kind of see mine here. Um, if I have a project that's already dialed in with my analog gear and just needs a little digital bump, um, you know, I have, I like this inflator plugin, and then I can use a, a limiter. And these are already kind of set. You know, you can see it's not doing much, but I can determine. But it has a lot of the details set, like, um, you know, the peak ceiling and all this stuff. So you can save effects chain presets. And if I'm working in the box, um, let me load in a, a song. Uh, let me load in. Did a bunch of singles for this guy, so that's why there's so many folders. But let me load in a song here. Um, now first, I can normalize it to my preferred in the box starting point. Um, I can load in an effects chain preset for these clips too. Uh, this is kind of a starting point I use a lot for clip effects, and that's kind of a lot of plugins, but they're doing very little. But I don't, as you can see, I don't have any like EQ. Um, preset because you always want to listen and decide what it needs but I do have the EQ set in a way that I like it you know natural phase some common trouble spots you know same with this um, plug-in um, you know some common again not doing anything but ready ready for action um, even this compressor the threshold is set in a way that when I do my normalization before starting the threshold is set in a way that it's just about to do some gain reduction and then I can um, figure out how much if what I want to do in the blend. So you can save effects chain presets. And to do that, you go up to the menu here and uh, save plugin chain. So right there is where you save a plugin chain. If I wanted to save this for future use, I could press that button. I can name it what I want to name it. It saves it in a default place. But I know some people that like to save their presets in the project folder. And you can do that as well. You can choose where it goes. Um, so yeah, effects chain presets are really useful. And you can, once you make it, you can load into a clip, track, or output. So you can do. So I use those all the time. I very rarely am adding one plugin at a time, uh, unless it's like I'm almost got it dialed in and it needs one more thing. Then then you can um, add it. And of course, I didn't really talk about this, but a great thing about WaveLab is the tabbed plugin window. You can turn this off, but I really like it because then you don't have a huge screen of plugins. You just have um, one window, and you can drag around the order, and you can see the plugins that you want to use. So effects chains are really, really useful. Um, let's see if we got any other questions. Um, one thing that... Uh, someone's asking about editing files. So let's say that you're in the montage, mastering, and you hear a little click or something. You can highlight it. And again, I just installed a new computer. So let's see if this works. But I press a shortcut. Yeah, it's working. That little section of audio is opening in RX. And let's say I want, let's say that this is a click. It looks more like a drum hit, but let's say it's a click. I can address that click however I need to. Save the file, close it, and now when I go back to the montage, that fixed version, as you can see by the name, the fixed version is now in line. So this is kind of nice for quick editing of, you know, spot editing. You know, I never run declickers on, like, the entire song because it can ruin other things. But if you find a little mouth click, you can highlight it, bring it in, fix it, um, save it, and now you're good to go. You can... Um, and then there's some wave lab is so deep that I don't have time to get into it all, but you can, like, once this is all fixed up, you can, um, highlight it and create a new file from it in the bounce 
um, section. So, yeah, really powerful stuff with that external editor. That's new to, to WaveLab 10. Um, looking through some other questions here. Um, someone's asking about WaveLab, WaveLab elements. You know, I, I have WaveLab elements on my laptop because I can open it without a, a licensor. It's just a little bit more limited. So um, if I was mastering every day, I'd probably, you know, I would need the pro version. The elements version is very functional for a lot of people. It's great for analysis. Um, some of the limitations would be you can't control the track markers. You know, every track is just the length of a clip, so you can't do that. Whereas, you know, when I'm doing some song overlaps, you know, I might need to determine where is the track marker going to be? Is it going to be right here, right here? Sometimes if this is like just feedback noise, you know, we have to decide, you know, should the track change kind of in the lull or should it start right on the downbeat? So these are the kind of stuff you get in the pro version. I think if you're using elements and you're reaching some limitations, that's when you know it's time to upgrade to pro. Um, um, analog processing usually done before, um, a little of both. Um, in January, I'm going to do a, a episode just on using the anal integrating the analog chain in WaveLab, and I do both. You know, I'll do a little bit of processing um, before going analog on as clip effects in the montage, which I'm going to go over all this. But you can apply some plugins before going analog to take care of any more serious issues or things that are best done digitally, and then you can hit your analog chain and do some of the I use the analog chain more for broader strokes, you know, some tone, some tubes, things like that. Um, and then I follow that up with some final digital limiting. You know, I never capture with digital limiting because it really paints you in a corner, um, especially if you overshoot it. You know, you can't really go backwards without redoing all the analogs. It's kind of a lot of backtracking. So I always capture without any digital limiting, but... You can always go up from there with digital limiting, but also I do a lot of stuff that goes to vinyl. And if you have your, if your captures are already limited, um, it's not great for pressing vinyl. It can be done, but not really advised. So it would be a lot of backtracking again to make that vinyl version. So for me, a typical thing is a little bit of digital processing to take care of anything. You know, I love the Soothe plugin. Of course, that's probably never going to be hardware. So I'll, some of that stuff would be done before going analog. Then, of course, whatever analog pieces are needed, and then um, follow that up with, um, I should probably use my web skills to maybe turn this camera on. Um, so, you know, maybe, so for me, it's a little bit of digital, analog, and then usually post-analog, it's very minimal stuff, like the tiniest EQ change, um, but mostly it's digital limiting, and then, of course, dithering. So, um is it better to do editing 32, 384? Well, there's no correct sample rate. It's more like whatever your computer can handle. I, I'm typically working at 96K. I think once you hit 96K, you reach the point of diminishing returns. And um, But that's really just my opinion. Um, you can, uh, let's see, reading a question here. The part about exporting. So, yeah, so you may want to watch the first video from, from April, but... I'm not saying there will be a problem, but, and I know people do this with um, other mastering programs too. It's not just WaveLab, but um, if you have overlapping songs and you have a bunch of plugins going or processing, if you try to render track by track, um, it's quite possible that when you butt those files back up, like a media player is going to play them, that there's a slight click or pop or discrepancy. And that's because plugins, um, you know, they need a little buffer time to get engaged how it would sound if you're actually playing it straight through and again i'm not saying there will be a problem but i have had problems and i'm kind of a worst case scenario person where um, i just develop a workflow where i'm never going to have that problem so i um, when i get it sounding how i like it i don't apply any dithering i just render a floating point file at that same sample rate and then wave lab there's a setting where wave lab will recreate the montage with all the markers the data and everything um, so everything carries over. The only difference is all your processing is locked in. And then from there, you can insert, you know, a 24-bit dither, and I could render, then I could render track by track, 24-bit 96K waves. Um, and then I can also sample rate. I can 
convert the 96K, that floating point 96K render, I can convert that down to 44.1 using um, the batch processor in WaveLab. Um, I think it was WaveLab 9, he upgraded it to um, SOX, which is a pretty good sounding one. Or if you have a third party one that you prefer, you can use any sample rate converter that you prefer and convert that floating point 96K file down to 44.1 floating point. And you can tell WaveLab to create a montage duplicate. So it's taking that um, process 96K version and it's referencing the 44.1 file and it's going to recreate the montage at 44.1. And now you can render your 24-bit uh, 44.1K files from the montage or 16-bit 44.1 DDP. And kind of the whole theory there is I like to assemble the montage once and then render. You know, I don't want to be assembling for each format or um, sample rate. You know, you basically you assemble once, do one long render, and then from there you can make anything really easily. And as a bonus, all the metadata is there. Um, if you're making waves or MP3s, DDP will have CD text, and it's all cohesive. There's no chance of there being a difference in song spacing between the wave versions for streaming and the CD version or the vinyl. So basically, you know, assemble. It's a little bit. Um, it's it's kind of a long game. You know, you gotta try to make make it as easy as possible for you down the road. Um, so basically, assemble one, surrender, and work your way down. I, I touched on it in the last video, but I'm going to be doing some really focused videos just on rendering. You know, once you're done with your processing. So hopefully that helps clear up. What is the computer rig? Um, recently added the Mac Pro, the new fancy one. And what's cool about it is, um, what's cool about it is you can uh, put RAM in, you can put storage in, um, PCI slots, you can see your memory. So um, pretty fast machine. Um, I also use an iMac Pro and a laptop, so um, obviously I'm a Mac person, but yeah, Wave, Wave Labs started on PC, but it's been Mac since version 7, I believe, yeah, version 7. So I'm going to try to field a few more questions, as long as there's people here. Any difference in mastering quality using straight rendered version at 96? Uh, um, you know, this is this where it gets a little bit subjective, but I prefer to work at higher sample rates. So if something comes in at 44.1 or 48K, I will upsample it to 96. If something comes in at 88.2 or 96 or higher, I keep it at that native sample rate. But obviously upsampling doesn't make it sound better, but I think that the digital analog processing can sound better at that at these higher sample rates. You know, I've done some tests and... You know, you can't make a blanket statement, and it's art, and it's subjective, but this is what works for me um, in my process. And then, you know, once I started implementing this, I feel like my work got better. Then I started getting better clients, and it just snowballs from there. So um, I will end it with uh, shots of my settings. Well, there's, I'm not sure which settings you mean, but if you let me know, I'll, I'll try to do that. Um, if you mark the song, uh, let's see. If anyone has any questions that I didn't get to, maybe type it again, because is there a way to carry over CD text of all tracks to metadata automatically? Definitely, and that's a huge part of why I use, Wave, why I use WaveLab. So uh, I'll try to do a demonstration here. This has already been entered um, very easily, but I'll show you, um, do a quick overview of what, what happened here. So um, oh yeah, that, that's why I can't find it. So here's here's a project that's been um, here's a project that's been rendered down a few a few steps, but I want to show you my main screen. So this has already been rendered, and I'm I'm down to the 44.1 version at 16-bit. 
But as you can see, the, the CD text is still there. And again, this was entered very quickly in a matter of seconds because of how well the files were named. The ISRC code, you only have to enter the first code and it populates it up. Um, so again, I, this is all data that was entered in a matter of seconds. But um, when I go to um, render files, I'm gonna choose, um, I'll choose 16-bit wave for now. And I'll render them to um, this folder. And another thing I love, love about WaveLab is you can really, you can just type in whatever you want. Um, for a f This folder doesn't exist yet, but as soon as I hit render, it's going to exist. So here's some files I'm rendering. And because my default montage has this already preloaded in the metadata tab, you press edit, and I have a little preset called JP start. And as you can see, in the ID3 version two field, it is transposing the CD text track title into the album title of metadata. Uh, sorry, CD text title is the album. CD text track title is gonna be the song title. Um, CD text track performer, in metadata terms, they call it lead performer. It gets a little convoluted, but you can have this stuff pre-programmed so that the CD text is automatically converted to metadata. So now what, I'm going to use a, a third-party app because it's it's good for double-checking. Um, these files I just rendered, as you can see, they're pretty flush with metadata. It has the track number, track total, uh, as the year. I, I, in an effort to get credits, I put my name in there. No one, no one probably ever sees it, but it has an important distinction here. Um, you know, the file name has the 01 to indicate the track number so that it stays in order in a folder system, but the song title has um, doesn't have that. It's uh, just got the clean album, clean song title. So, yeah, it's very easy to, and I'll have to do a specific episode on metadata, but in essence, you're um, entering the data once. Again, I know I'm repeating myself, but I can enter the data in about five seconds, and then anytime I render waves or MP3s, um, the metadata is in there, and it's everything's consistent. You know, there's no variations. I only have to enter it once, so whatever I enter is going to be everywhere. And as long as it's correct, everything just goes where it needs to go. And then same with DDP. Um, you know, it is CD text, so when you render a DDP, the titles are the same there. So I'm pretty diligent with my clients about getting the information up front correctly spelled punctuation so that I can just copy and paste their information. So I have a great starting point. Of course, if you need to change it, you need to change it. But I would say 98% of projects, um, I get the correct information up front and it's done. And I don't think about it again. So I never even open the metadata tab except for when I'm explaining how to use it. But by default, you'll see when I make a new montage, let's say I'm starting a new one right now, um, part, of my, part of my default montage template is that this metadata preset's already loaded. So it's pretty much set it and forget it. You don't you don't even have to think about metadata other than making sure that everything's spelled correctly, but you don't have to do it in a separate step. I only use that third app just to verify things and, and, and stuff like that, but you don't even need a, another app. Um, um, Sonarworks plugin should be in the playback slot, not effects slot, right? Um, yeah, let me go over that again. So the master section is... Um, right here. Let me do this so it looks more normal. So I don't, I don't know if I, I definitely don't have Sonarworks in, on this computer, but um, you don't want to use Sonarworks in the effects slots because um, yes, you're going to hear it, which is your goal, but if you have it in the effects slots, then it's in a lot of danger of being included in your rendered files. Um, so you have to remember to bypass or turn that off, and that can just lead to problems. But more importantly, it's going to be part of your metering. So like if if Sonar, and I know Sonarworks has to do this, it has to turn the gain down to compensate for any EQ changes. So your levels are not going to be correct either. So the advantage to having Sonarworks in the playback processing is that you're only hearing it, but it's not registering on the meters and it's not um, 
in danger of being rendered in your files. You can just keep it active the entire time. And I've had people tell me that it's not available, and that might be true because when you set up WaveLab, you have to go to File, Preferences, Plugins, and each plugin, let me try to find a good candidate for this. Um, I think I have a different, I have Can Opener by Goodhertz, which I obviously don't use, but um, by default, most plugins are only available as effects. So if you look in this um, column, it's in the effect, it's activated. We need to go and manually activate it for play, which is playback processing. So now that play is activated, I can go back to my file and I will see Goodhertz Can Opener available in the playback processing. So if a plugin that you want is not available in playback processing, you just have to go to File, Plugins, find it, and um, allow it to be there. Um, so um, in this section, you also have to do it for the final effects dithering, because by default, there's not many. By default, there's really only dithering stuff here. and um, But you can put anything you want available there. Um, playback, I just talked about. The Dyn column is more for universal audio plugins for dynamic processing, meaning it's only taxing the card, the UAD card, if you're using it. And then sometimes, as long as I'm in this area, you really don't want the generic, the GEN for generic, to be um, checked. If you ever open a plugin in the, the graphic, if the interface looks really generic, like just sliders and not how you're expecting, you probably somehow this generic box got checked because that just makes it so the interface is generic and doesn't look um, all fancy. And sometimes that can be good for troubleshooting. But so yeah, um, getting off track, but yeah, sonar works I, or any room correction or headphone correction or even some external metering. You know, some people have a favorite metering plugin that they want to use in addition. Put it in the playback processing slot because then there's no danger of it being in, involved in your rendering and it's not going to screw up your meters. So it looks like there's still questions, so I'll try to keep answering them. Where does one edit montage default? So let's say you have a montage. Um, probably what you would need to do for you is um, make a new montage and get it how you like it. But once you have it how you like it, you can go to File. Um, and I don't do that. It's been a while since I did this, but um, Templates. So you go to Montage, New uh, Templates, and then you can add a template. And one of the options is um, create template based on, you know, this. so it would say whatever your current montage is. So you want to create the template based on the montage that you have open. And you probably don't want to include clips, right, because you want it to be a clean, empty montage. You probably don't want it to include plugins because every project's different, but maybe you do. Probably don't want it to include markers. So I have all this stuff turned off, but then you could give it a name. You know, I have, you can see my existing names. You know, I have one for 96K albums, one if I'm at 88.2. I don't use these lower ones very often, but um, so you can save a bunch of templates how you want to. And you can even assign shortcuts. So um, you can write, once you have a template, you can right click and you can define a shortcut. For me, it's Control 9 for 96K. Um, but if I want to make 88.21, I have it set to control eight. Um, so you can set, um, not only can you make a template, but you can set a shortcut for it. So again, get the montage dialed in how you want, load up your metadata preset, how you want, get everything, how you want it, basically, then go to file templates and then add that template, give it a name that makes sense to you and save it. And then it's, a, it'll be available, um, because for me, I mean, when I'm doing, whether it's a single EP or an album, it's always from the same um, montage template. The only difference would be, you know, I have one producer that sends me stuff at 192, so I'll be there. But 98% um, of the time, it's 96K. You get the occasional 88.2 oddball or 192. But pretty much every project I do, because I, I do such a specific thing, you know, I'm not post-production. I'm, I'm just doing working with bands and artists, I'm pretty much always starting from the same template uh, montage. And again, that's just for settings. It's not like a certain EQ or anything. I would never want to do that. Only three slots. Yes, um, there is a recent thread on the 
WaveLab Forum to a request for more playback processing slots. So for anyone that's not been on the WaveLab Forum, um, the WaveLab developer is very active on there. And if you make a feature request, uh, I can't guarantee it, but there's a few people that have voiced support for more playback slots, which I think is good. You know, and everyone's working remotely now with um, COVID-19 and headphone correction, speaker correction, I think three slots, I think five slots would be great. So there's been some requests for that. So if you add your support for that, maybe you'll get um, a future version. We'll see more playback processing slots. But yeah, right now it's re um, limited to only three. Um, and I'm just trying to find a few more questions. Metadata acts differently in the audio editor versus montage. Yeah, that's... That's why I really don't even use the audio editor because um, another thing you can do in the montage is um, add the artwork too. So typically an album has the same artwork for every song. So you just choose picture, you find the artwork, and then you add the artwork. So if you're doing um, metadata in the audio editor, to me that's a little tedious because you're doing it file by file. And that can just, again, get tedious. So why not do it in the montage so that when you render each track, it's going to incorporate a whole lot of information, such as, like I showed you, that it's going to know that it's track one of ten, track three of ten, four of ten, um, and that and media players can see that information and, and utilize it. So um, again, I, I never really do metadata in the audio editor. Um, if I was going to go song by song, I'd probably honestly use this third-party app because you can see all the songs and copy and paste to multiple songs at the same time. So. Um, you can do metadata in the audio editor. It's just, again, a little more um, slower. Is it possible to make a playback loop in the audio montage? Um, I, th I wonder if he means, you know, loop, uh, you know, just looping audio. So let me open a montage here. Um, another great thing with WaveLab is you right-click, you can see all your recent montages it's just a lot of good time saving stuff so yeah, you can you can select an area and loop it um, there's a shortcut for turning loop on and off um, in the transport bar and I have it programmed as the slash backslash but it's this button right here so now with that on it's going to keep looping that spot and for me, it helps to select it from right to left, which seems backwards, but that way, if you select from left to right, well, maybe he changed, maybe it got updated, but it used to be, if you select from left to right, it would just keep playing after the loop, and that got, that didn't help. But yeah, you can loop, you can definitely loop audio, and you can create a shortcut to turn the loop. You can see down at the bottom here, oh, I'm totally, um, I'm an amateur when it comes to uh, web streams, as you can tell, but um as you guys probably missed, I, I made it so the transport's visible at the bottom, and there's this loop button here. So I have a shortcut of backslash, but you can just toggle the loop on and off, and um, it was off. So now I'll do a shorter loop so you can see it keep going. But yeah, you can loop little sections in the montage as well. You just got to find that button in the transport or program a shortcut, and it should work. Um, so Bob says, I never edit files in the audio. Yeah, I always edit in the montage, again, because it's destructive. Now, um, like I said, if you're, if you're um, doing uh, sound design and you're calling the shots and you don't have to answer to anyone that's indecisive, you know, maybe, yeah, you could edit, you could edit them in the audio editor because it's pretty destructive. But for me, you know, I'll go back to that um, album. This was one where we played with the fade out quite a bit on one of the songs, and doing that in the audio editor would have been, to me, challenging because um, we kept playing like down to milliseconds of how it should sound at the very tail end. And to do that in the audio editor, you'd probably have to save copies of each version. You know, here's version one fade out. Um, so to do it in the montage, it's just great because, you know, he could have decided to fade it out. 20 seconds earlier and then I send him that version and then then he could say never mind I want the whole thing and I can just peel it back so 
montage for me, I mean, I, I to me, the montage is Wave Lab. You know, I, I, I have a hard, I have a hard time committing to anything in the audio editor because again, it's so destructive, and I'm just of the mindset of someone's going to want it just a little bit different, and then it's just harder to manage. So. The montage is great, even if it's single songs. Even, you know, sound design, I'd probably be doing it in the montage because you can have many tracks in the montage. I honestly don't know if there's a limit, but um, you can have many tracks. I've never run out. So that's a long answer to that question, but um, I'm not sure. I mean, WaveLab Elements should be able to loop. I don't have a copy installed here to test it myself, but um, I'll try to get try to get back to that and um yeah i think bob came in a little late yeah no problem i haven't been able to see even if anyone's watching but um yeah so the to summarize the audio editor is just very destructive it's good for yes i want to do this right now and be done with it um, but if you're working with clients that want to say oh let's try this let's try that the montage which is non-destructive is just so much so much more flexible and you can save version numbers so as you can see even though he only wanted one tiny change of a song fade out, I made a version three. And if he wanted one more, I would make a version four because I always want to be able to get back to version three, version two, because sometimes they'll say split the difference. Sometimes they'll say, oh, it's actually perfect on version one. Instead of having to guess what version one is, you can simply open version one. And by whatever means you feel is best, you can um, get back to it. precisely how that was. You're not guessing um or it takes the guesswork out you're just um because the those montage files are so tiny they're like um kilobytes you know it's it's not recreating all the wave files so is there a way to have separate floating windows of all the plugins um yes there is a setting if you go to the inspector and again i'm a live stream amateur so sorry for the missing windows sometimes if you go to um, it's separate for the master section but for clips I'll try to find one that has a lot of clips or a lot of pl a clip that has a lot of plugins if that yeah this one needed a, more than usual touch-ups but um, you can go to menu and plug-in window handling and this is where you choose um, one window per plugin. I, I have it set to use plugin chain windows, but, and again, I don't do this often, so I'm experimenting live here. But um, yeah, so if you prefer having all your windows, you can totally do that. Um, but there is the plugin chain window, and there are some options. I want to see if there's an option to sort of mix some of that. And again, the master section has its own settings for this. If you go to um, this window, use plugin chain window. That's just for the master section. It's asking me to remove all the plugins, but master section is separate from the inspector in this regard. But let me close this. Use plug-in chain windows. Let's see what our options are, because I honestly don't look at this too often. Um, you can use one for clips and tracks. So you may want to play around with these settings and see um, which is best for you. But you know, you can. There are locks on some of these windows. Um, and you know, there's of course presets. You can save a. I showed you how to save an effects chain, but you can also within a plugin itself. You know, some plugins have their own preset menu, but you can also use the WaveLab uh, menu and do preset save as and, and do it that way. So, yeah. So hopefully that answers the question enough for now about plugin windows. Let's see. Um, yeah, you said that helps, so that's good. Uh, someone's speaking my language here any difference in workflow using master section and clip track output section to insert plugins which one do you prefer and why i strongly 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 prefer not using the master section for my workflow because of things i talked about um, earlier um, 
for one, the master section is not automatically tied to a file or montage. It's just kind of that's that's why I make a point to call it the global master section because it's global to the entire program. So as if you have 30 files open and you're switching between them, the master section doesn't automatically change as you can see. It just stays the same and you have to use this little star down here to load and save the master section separately with each file. And if you work quickly or if you're a little spacey like me sometimes, you may forget to save or load the exact settings and then you got a problem. So that's why I'm only using the master section for my Clarity M and it's empty otherwise. Now, when you're working with an audio file in the audio editor, this is the only place to insert plugins so that you have to use it and you have to be careful. Um, and you have to make sure that you're load, loading and saving the settings with each audio file. But again, I, I never do processing in the audio editor. So in the montage, I much prefer clip um, the inspector, which is for me up here. For you, it may be something like this, where you have master section and inspector. But um, I much prefer this because I can do just the plugins that this song needs, just the plugin that that song needs as clip effects. And those are first in the chain. And then track effects, I talked about this, but we don't use, I really don't use track effects because that affects the entire montage track. It's not a CD, it's not talking about CD tracks or album tracks, it's talking about audio tracks. And the output affects the entire montage. So this is basically like your master fader of the montage. Um, and all this stuff gets stored in the montage file. So I know I'm repeating myself, but anything in the master section, you have to manually save and load. And it's affecting everything equally last. Whereas with the montage workflow, you can get in, you can get song specific, and then you can put like a maybe a global final limiter and final dither you know, at the very end, and that's going to affect everything um, the same. So that's a good place for final stuff like that, final peak, true peak limiter, final dither. Um, or if you just need to do one thing to all the songs equally, that's a great place to do it. So, and then that's all stored in the dot mon, the montage file, which is a very small file. And um, for my brain, that makes sense to me because all I have to worry about is the montage file and it's saved and I can close it and I can move on and I'm sorry that you can't see. Um, so I'll try to recap that a little bit, but um, the inspector is basically um, powerful in the montage because you can do clip effects here um, and your output effects here. So for me, that works really well. That's kind of like the equivalent equivalent of saving your DAW session file because everything you'd expect to be saved is saved in there. Whereas if you're only applying effects here in the master section and you don't load and save it and you close the montage, well, there's no guarantee that all these settings are saved. So to me, there's just too much disconnect between um, the master section and, and the montage. But if you're working in, in the audio editor, then you just have to, this is the only place to do effects. You just got to be a little more careful um, and remember that this is a global master section. So if you have two audio files open, you know, I could insert an EQ here or a limiter and crank it way up. Ridiculous. Um, as you can see, when I when I toggle between the, the, the two songs, um, it's doing the same processing. So it doesn't automatically just know what settings are for which song. Um, and that's just kind of the nature of the program. You know, it started as a editor like this and evolved into the montage. So, you know, some people like to use the master section. I just, when I first came to WaveLab, I just had a really hard time with that because I was used to something else. And then this stuff was added and it's great for me. So anything that's in clip, track, or output is automatically saved in the montage. And then I can, I don't have to worry about it. So I have covered that a few times. Sorry if I'm repeating myself. Um, I think we're, looks like we're possibly to the end of any questions unless I missed one and someone wants to re, re ask it. I'm happy to answer it. Um, probably should wrap up in the next 10 minutes, but cause I went a little long, but that'll happen. So if there's no more questions, I'll give it a minute. Cause I know there's a slight, slight leg. 
But if there are no more questions, I'm glad that we had some people tuning in. This will be available to watch on YouTube for the end of time. And um, watch for these monthly. Like I said, probably going to try to stick to like the third Thursday of every month. It gets a little weird with the holidays. So December 17th, Pete Lyman will be interviewing him. Um, and I'm going to sprinkle in some other Wave Lab guests in the future. So it's going to be kind of a combination of tutorial type stuff and then some interviews to kind of mix it up and make it interesting. And um, yeah, so thanks for tuning in. I don't see any more questions coming in, so I'm going to wrap it up. You can always go to the Wave Lab users Facebook group um, and ask questions there. That's that's probably the best place to get a hold of me. Um, I, and ask questions and it's great if you can ask them in the group because then other people can see the answers um, and learn from it too instead of a direct message and of course there's the wave lab forum on steinberg's website really great resources and you can interact with um, pg who is the author and um, and yeah um, january is going to be what i'm going to demonstrate how i do the analog chain there's more than one way to get a uh, signal to your analog chain. You can use the external effects plugin, or you can use some of the new features in WaveLab 10 with the reference track, which is what I prefer. So um, January is when we'll, I'm going to go have a special episode just for that. Um, last question I'll answer from 420 is um, save a preset of all plugins for a clip effects chain. So yeah, I think I did that already, but um, let me just make a clip effects chain of random stuff. So let's say, let's say I love how this sounds and I kind of want to use it as a um, starting point for future projects or you can copy and paste effects chains to other clips. So let's say, um, let's say all these songs are basically the same sounding. Um, you can and again, I have this all on shortcuts, so forgive me if I'm being slow, but you can use this copy button to um, copy. Actually, you have to do it in the menu. Copy all. I have this on shortcuts, but you can copy all, and then you can um, paste it. And you can select a bunch of clips and paste it to multiple clips at the same time as well. But let's say you want to save this effects chain for like a few uh, another day. You just go to the... Um, this icon for save plugin chain. Oh man, I gotta learn how to how to switch cameras better. I need a foot pedal or something. But sorry about that. So let's say you have this effects chain, and uh, I think what I need to do is just never use the webcam because it's it's useless. But anyway, let's say you have this effects chain um, that you love. You can um, go to the save menu. Press this button, say plugin chain. You can type it in. Um, it, it, it gives a pretty useful name by default, but you can change it to whatever you want. And press save, and you can control where it's being saved. And then um, let's say this album, I know I just did this, but let's say all the songs kind of sound the same, and you want to use the same starting point for clip effects. Um, you can go to menu, copy all. I have this as a shortcut, as you can see, which is option P. Um, so I could just select this clip do option P and then um, I could invert the selection. Now I've got every other song selected and I could do um, paste to selected clips. And now all those songs have the same plugin chain, which is for some albums that might be a decent starting point. If, if you get an album where every song is like a very similar mix and same instrumentation or it's a live album or something, um, maybe that works for you. Again, as a starting point, you would never, you still want to listen to it and make it sound correct. But anyway, so that's effects chains. Um, and yeah, so I'm going to leave it there cause it's, it's going on almost two hours now. So, um, yeah, I will get a foot pedal to switch screens next time for sure. And I'll get a little better at this. So thanks for bearing with me. Definitely going to wrap it up, but again, feel free to ask questions in the forums. There are settings to download in the video notes, and uh, you can also request future topics. But January, we'll definitely do analog chain in the uh, in Wave Lab. So, thanks for watching.